In 2022, I started watching a lot more TV and this year there were some amazing shows released. So in this video, I'm gonna be giving you guys my top five favorite shows of 2022. Right out of the gate, I do wanna mention the two notable shows that I haven't watched that came out this year were House of Dragon and Rings of Power. I just never watched Game of Thrones and I've also never seen the Lord of the Rings movies. So I didn't really think it was fitting for me to go ahead and watch these shows without watching the rest of the stuff in the franchise. But hopefully eventually I'll get to both of those franchises and I'll leave my thoughts somewhere on the internet at some point. Also to note, I did watch 11 total shows this year, but I'm only giving my top five list just because these are the five shows I wanna talk about most. And before we get into it, if you guys are near in here, let me know your favorite shows of the year in the comments down below. And while you're down there, if you're near in here and you enjoy all my movies, and TV show reviews, reactions, and breakdowns. Make sure to subscribe and turn notifications on so you don't miss any time I up a new video or I go live. Both of us some more time. Let's get into it. Quickly, I do want to give an honorable mention and right outside of my top five is FX's Under the Banner of Heaven. Now, the reason why this isn't in my top five is strictly because it took me a while to get through and really true crime isn't my type of show. I've never watched a true crime show and really the only reason I went into this show is because it had Andrew Garfield. Now, there are a bunch of other amazing performances. Wyatt Russell is in this show. Daisy Edgar Jones is in this show, along with, again, a bunch of other great performances. But at the end of the day, this show didn't do anything too amazing for me. I think the premise of Andrew Garfield's character finding secrets about the LDS religion and stuff like that, that was all very, very cool to me. And I was interested in that. But other than that, all of the side characters, none of them were super interesting. But again, it told me just a good enough story to be outside of my top five. But starting off the top five in fifth place for me is Peacemaker. Now looking back on this show, I do have a few more flaws than right after I finished watching it. But that's not to say this isn't an absolutely awesome show. I do find that as time goes on, I like James Gunn's comedy a little bit less and less. And a lot of it doesn't age too well, along with like all of those like repeated fart jokes and stuff like that. That doesn't make me laugh as much anymore. But I still think from a character and story standpoint though it's not like the most grand thing ever and the story overall is a little bit forgettable at times I think they interlock our characters and motivations, all of these twists and turns within the story so well, and that's just a testament to James Gunn's amazing writing. I think they interlock these characters, give them so much more emotion than you actually think. And again, right out of the gate, you think they're just super goofy and silly characters that really hold no emotional weight. But even the smallest of characters in this show do feel like they have some emotional arcs. And maybe it's because I just wasn't expecting it from Peacemaker. Maybe Peacemaker wasn't a my radar to be a show like that. So I was really surprised when they pulled that off by the end. But on top of all of that, it had that classic superhero action that I love. And also on top of that, going off of the Suicide Squad movie, which came out last year, I think they do a great job of not only furthering Peacemaker's character, but also just emotionally giving us so much more to work with with this character. And it really bounces off the Suicide Squad really well. This is arguably the best comic book movie show, like spinoff type of thing directly from a movie. It's one of the only ones if I'm not mistaken, but the way that it does bounce off of the Suicide Squad and it takes moments from that movie and directly impacts our characters' emotional moments, choices, and different pieces of their trauma coming together to help them make decisions in this show. I think this show has a great interlinking between the Suicide Squad and even on its own, it stands as an absolutely awesome show with such a fun time. Now, fourth place for me is Andor. I really, really, really love this show. After Andor came out, I did a full tier list of all all the Star Wars projects I watched because I just got to watching all of them for the first time this year. You can click the link somewhere up here or in the description down below if you want to check that out. But I was an amazing video where I actually got to talk a lot more about Star Wars and in talking about it, I kind of realized that this universe is so similar in the way that it's been telling stories. It feels like it really scripts sits, sticks to a script in terms of the amount of storytelling that they have. And I feel like the Mandalorian definitely separated themselves from that a little bit, but I think Andor does it the best and the most. I mean, obviously you're still in that general story of the rebellion and that completely makes sense. But the way that the show introduces you to these amazing side characters that, though I do think could be more fleshed out, 
Granted, we are still getting a season two, so I feel like I'm not judging it enough, like well enough, because we have a season two with all these characters returning and getting further development on these characters. So I think as time goes on, I'm gonna love the show more and more. But as of now, you have 12 episodes, you have these three episode mini arcs. There's other shows on this list that do a similar format of the three episode mini arcs. And I think it works really well here in Andor. I mean, episodes one through three were definitely a very slow start. And that's definitely where I dock the most points for this show, just because I definitely definitely feel like you could have made it just a little bit faster pick up episodes one and two just a little bit more especially to get people intrigued and I completely understand for story purposes it's 100% necessary to have those slow moments in episodes one and two and really build up your world and your characters because these are pretty much all fresh characters except for Cass and Andor who was in Rogue One and even then this is a prequel show and so this is technically a whole new character that we haven't really gotten to see before and it's kind of the evolution of what we're going to end up seeing in Rogue One. And so with all of those factors in combination, I still do believe the first three episodes should have been a little faster. And then you get through episodes four through seven and then eight through 12. And you have such amazing arcs with such amazing characters introduced. And I was watching the show on a weekly basis. I fell behind maybe one week where I'd watch two episodes, but this was an amazing week to week journey. I mean, you get these full length, like 50 to 60 minute episodes every single week telling a detailed and intricate and very cared for story. Really no other show on this list has really given us that much character development in a show. Granted, this is probably the show that had the longest total runtime of any show on this entire list. That's just one thing I really respect about Andor is that it really goes into the nitty gritty. It really goes into the detail and it understands to fully get immersed into these characters and their world and their fight in the rebellion. You have to understand the characters and it takes as much time as it needs to to get to that point. Next up on the list in third place for me is FX's The Bear. This show is insanely amazing. I actually just watched this about a month before recording this video and it's because I was like, okay, I see this on Hulu, I have to check it out. All of my friends had seen it and everyone was hyping it up on Twitter, on TikTok, all social medias. And I was like, is this really gonna live up to the hype? I mean, it's like eight 30 minute episodes. How great can it be? And I thought the same thing about my number two spot, which I'll get into just a second. But the bear, it does something so amazing with this idea of cooking. It really takes like the whole just genre of cooking shows and it just adds so much visceral emotion. And so it adds action, which I don't know how you do that to a cooking show, but it just adds so much depth to every single one of these characters through just cooking. It's literally just the way that this story is told that carries over to making all of these characters so emotionally heavy and adding so much baggage to the entire story. I mean, it starts off with a pretty sad story about our main character, Carmi's like brother dying and stuff like that and him taking over the business. There's a lot of heartfelt stuff here. And I think all of those emotions and honestly, the setup of the story before the story actually begins that's what makes the show so great. I think that's what sets it up for success. But also you have all of these other amazing characters. I mean, you have Richie, Sydney, Natalie, Marcus, Jimmy, Tina. You have all of these great and super interesting and just honestly, very intriguing characters that I feel like what makes a show so great is you can balance all of these plot lines and stuff like that. And I think that's what separates my two and three for me is that in my second place, I feel like all of these side characters definitely have more of an in-depth story outside of what we're getting in our main, main story in the what would be the kitchen and the bear. And so I think the bear doesn't go really outside of the kitchen with these side characters. But I think it goes outside the kitchen enough with our main characters of Carmi and Richie. And I think that if you flesh out your main characters enough and you give them enough emotion, then it kind of makes up for less of an exploration in our side characters' lives outside of our main story. And so I think the bear does that very, very well. On top of all of this, the cinematography of the bear is amazing. There is one scene, I think it's episode seven. It is literally the entire episode is a one take. Obviously it's not all done actually in one take, but it's made to look like a one take and it's absolutely amazing the finale episode eight if i'm not mistaken literally starts with a monologue i think it's like seven minutes for our main character carmi it's just amazing this show really it elevates so much from the first episode to the final episode and you're like okay how did we get from here to here but then you kind of think about it, it's like 
This slow progression is really just embodied in all of the characters as well. And to see the story move forward, I am I will be waiting. I am biting my nails, waiting for a season two. I'm so excited to see the future of this show, the future of these characters, seeing where all of this goes. But moving on, in second place, my second favorite TV show of 2022 is Barry. Now, it's kind of weird for me to judge all of these shows strictly because this is Barry season three that released in 2022. And so am I judging three seasons worth of Barry compared to like one season of The Bear, one season of Andor, one season of Peacemaker? So I feel like it's a little bit unfair to judge it in that sense. But I'm going to say strictly off of just season three. But then again, you could be like, season three wouldn't be as good as the buildup if, if it wasn't for the buildup in seasons one and two. Again, I don't really know how to judge TV shows. That's why I stick to movies mostly. But Barry season three, I watched all of Barry in like four days. Again, it's eight episodes, 30 minutes each. It does what the bear does, but just on a whole other level, in my opinion. And the main reason I believe that is because of what I said about the side characters earlier. I think what, what Barry does so well is... In seasons one and two, it created such an emotional connection to Barry himself and trying to understand what he's going through in this absolutely absurd and stupid and crazy life that Barry has. That in season three, whenever you take everything you had in seasons one and two and you kind of just blow it up and expand it to the maximum possibility and you implement all of these crazy techniques of storytelling you had into every other character and you make every other character just as compelling as your main character of Barry, that's what gives you some generational television. I mean, Barry is amazing and yes, it's story, yes, it's characters, but also the cinematography is so great. I mean, there's some shots, there's some lighting, there's some sequences. That motorcycle chase sequence in this season is one of my favorite scenes of television this year. Barry is just all around. It's so well crafted. The characters are so emotional. Bill Hader gives arguably the best performance of this entire year. You also have Anthony Kerrigan, who's the mob boss dude. Dude, he is awesome. You have Sarah Goldberg. All of these amazing characters built up into what feels like it should be a final season in season three. And this is where I kind of get into my worries. Now, I did make a full video review on Barry because my friend and I both, wa both watched Barry in like under six days and we made a spoiler review about season three and pretty much the entire show. So if you wanna check that out, it'll also be linked somewhere up here. We absolutely love the show, but I'm also kind of worried about season four. Now, I'm not gonna get any spoilers for Barry season three because the end of the season is absolutely insane. But I don't really know where they're going to go with Barry season four, especially trying to figure out where this story is headed. I could see where some of the side characters are headed, but where does our overall story, what direction does it go in? I'm very excited to see because I feel as if Bill Hader knows this show well enough to actually craft us a very interesting and compelling story. And also, if I'm not mistaken, season four is going to be the final season. And so that's very exciting as well to see how this entire show wraps up. But for now, Barry season three, in addition to seasons one and two and how they build everything up so perfectly, this is definitely my second favorite show of the year. But coming in at first place, my favorite show of 2022, for me, that has to be The Boys season three. Now, arguably, I do think Barry season three or The Bear could be the better shows of the year. But for me, I absolutely adore any superhero project, whether it's about heroes or villains or in the case of the boys both i think superhero projects just that's what i really enjoy and seeing what the boys has done with superhero projects is absolutely amazing in a time where we live with marvel and dc releasing these humongous projects whether they be movies or tv shows i love the boys in the sense that every little detail in terms of character and story is very well thought out. I mean, it's like through eight episodes of season three, you just have such a massive story that unfolds. I don't even know how the writers do it. I'm gonna be honest with you. Even the source material, apparently the boys comics aren't even that great. But just this cast that's absolutely amazing. They all put on phenomenal performances. I mean, Anthony Starr as Homelander is Arguably, again, arguably the best performance of the year. I mean, Bill Hader, Anthony Starr, even Carl Urban as Butcher this season. I mean, this season 
really just brings together all the best aspects of seasons one and two as well. I mean, it does this amazing thing of, yes, you have all these built up storylines, but you also have these brand new characters introduced. We also have like what Andor does in the sense that you have these three episode arcs, especially in the first three episodes, which is what they've been doing for every single season thus far. I mean, you have these amazing three episode arcs where characters are completely different within three episodes of the season and when you have eight episodes total each episode being around 45 to 50 minutes long you have so much story to tell you have so much that you can really get out there with your characters and with this plethora of characters and the amount of possible storylines they have to tell and how much social commentary they really like to include in their show I'm really surprised and always in awe whenever they end up pulling this show off. I mean, I did do a live stream talking about right before the season finale. I did a live stream with my best friend and we were pretty much just talking for like an hour straight about our theories, questions, anything we want to talk about regarding season three's finale. And our main concern was like, how do they top like every previous episode? Like, how do you top Herogasm? How, and because it, for me personally, Herogasm was a what, like episode six? Episode seven had already topped that. So I was like, how do you get on a higher level than that? And they somehow did it, at least in my opinion. I mean, they create this formula in a sense for every season with the episode arcs, but everything is always so different. And I'd love to see it as a fan of just superhero projects in general i love to see how different it can get and how creative you can really get with all of these different powers stories these overarching arcs i mean you have arcs that are still not completed from season one but it's not like they're just holding it off i mean obviously other storylines take priority over it but you have this just this underlying battle between butcher and homelander since season one that still has not been resolved but you don't feel like it's like oh they're just dragging it out to let the show go on there are so many storylines that just keep you so enthralled and immersed in the world of the boys they're like oh no keep this battle going i could watch two, three more seasons of this show, no matter how long you go at this point. I mean, I think going into season three is a little bit different for me, but at this point forward, I do believe that you could go for two or three more seasons and still keep everything very unique. I mean, even season three did this amazing thing with taking political talk and implementing into the show perfectly. And every single time I'm like, oh no, like there's no way they can implement that into the show. It happened too soon to while they're shooting the, the, the show and like, there's no way they can implement it well. I watch the show, it's implemented and I'm like, dude, they did it so perfectly. I mean, it fits into these overarching stories, arcs, characters, relationships. They somehow just emerge every possible aspect of a perfect superhero show and an enjoyable show in general. And then you have The Boys. But guys, that's pretty much it for my top five favorite shows of 2022. As always, let me know your five favorite shows of the year in the comments down below. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Peace.